Morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to We'll Work for Food, the new Possibilities Hour. Today is January 25th, 2024 already. Hard to believe how this month has flown. Um, we're here today for another one of these fantastic programs that raises lots of money for food banks around the world and feeds feeds the world as I like to say, feed your mind while feeding the world. And we'll get to the amount in just one minute. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about our speaker today. Um, we are very uh, pleased to have, um, <laughs> have an amazing presentation about animals. And speaking on behalf of the animals will be Deborah Hamilton, who's the principal at HLM. As... Um, as I said to her, you know, what is this like the song "Who Let the Dogs Out" or uh, or whatever? She has lots of lots of stories for us, and I can tell you from personal experience, I actually did get a call once about mediating a case of a couple who had lived together, not married, and they were going their separate ways, and it was all about the pet, the dog. So um, I'm sure we'll learn a lot today. But first, let's learn how much we've uh, raised so far. And that is based on what people have told us they've donated to food banks. So, Jeff, what's our number today? Jean, thank you so much. We're so honored that people have responded so beautifully to the appeals that people contribute to food banks in honor of our great speakers. As of today, our running total is... $518,405.19. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Gene Lawler, back to you. Thanks, Jeff. That just, that number just blows my mind. I mean, that is just so amazing. And I can see, you know, a million dollars right ahead. So uh, taking it a, a land at a time, as my husband used to say about Disneyland, um, let's let's hit that 525 mark maybe we'll hit that today or uh next week so anyway deborah hamilton and um how mediation better serves all animals in those emotionally charged disputes i'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you deborah maybe you can tell us a little bit about your suggested food bank or um what you'd like us to support and then take it from there thank you I absolutely will, Jean. Thank you all so much for being here. I am so grateful to be able to talk about this topic. It's not a usual topic. Most mediators don't necessarily handle conflicts between people over animals. Uh, and it is an up and coming disagreement that mediation serves so much more um, supportively, I don't know how to put it any other way, because to have someone else make a decision for you when it comes to your pet is great to have that in the wings. However, really you wanna make sure you're um, you're doing what's best for your pet. Um, so my charities, uh, Nikki has put them in the side. One is the Animal Alliance and the other is the Cat Protection Council. One is a general group for all animals in the city of New York, which is my hometown. The other is a group that TNR's cats um, in Westchester County, and they need as much as they can. So if you can see your way clear to donate any amount to any of them would be great. You'd be saving the lives of cats and dogs. So without further ado, let me um, get back to the shared screen. Ah, there it is, finding. There we go, was the right one. Uh, hold on. You know, everything works well when you're doing it before everybody's on, but it doesn't work well when you're doing it when everyone's on. Um, so let me just start this. And this is going to, I'm going to go through this quickly, but I think that most people don't know um, what conflicts over animals really are. There's the All right. Uh, so I put this slide up here simply to let you know where I have tried to create an alliance to bring mediation to the people who need it. I think all of us understand that, you know, you can join AAA and JAMS, 
jams and AAA don't really want me because there aren't a lot of animal conflicts going through there. I realized that at the beginning. So I had to build alliances with people who were faced with conflicts over animals. So I became very involved in the veterinary industry. I go to more veterinary conferences than I go to law conferences. Um, I am part of different animal law groups in both the ABA, the New York State Bar Association, and I just finished up my um, tenure with the New York City Bar Association. Uh, it, it's the way in which we mediators can find our clients if in fact, you know, we're not getting um, a lot of traction uh, in the typical commercial employment um, group. So I'm often asked by attorneys what I do, and they're incredulous when I say I resolve conflicts between people over animals. Uh, they usually figure I'm separating the dogs. Uh, and I usually say, yes, I'd rather separate the dogs and the people. They're much easier. But my answer is no, I don't separate the dogs. I support curious discussions in conflicts over animals. And I want to say, I wrote a book that was in that um, little litany that was nipped in the bud, not in the butt, how to use mediation to resolve conflicts over animals. And one of the people who helped me with the title was Temple Grandin, which some of you might know. Um, I had had um, between animal, between people or something. She says, no, 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 because she's neurotypical and she's wonderful. She said, just say over. And I said, you know, you're right. So she is credited with the title to my book uh, and it is about conflicts over animals. So if you give me a minute, I'm gonna just share my journey um, on how I got here. So like most of you, I took a 40 hour mediation course and then I took another one and then I took another one and then I took another one because I was a litigator. And it's, I think, difficult for litigators to take on the mindset of a mediator. I think, you know, psychologists um, are have a much easier uh, road to becoming a mediator than a litigator because we always know better, right? Uh, I credit Gary Friedman of the Center for Understanding for getting me here because I took his training and I said to him, Gary, you know what I really want to do is I want to help people in conflict over animals, you know, in divorce, landlord, tenant, breeder, owner, handler contracts, um, rescues, uh, anything that has to do with an animal, wildlife, uh, Africa, I'm involved in two or three charities in Africa as well. Um, and, and he said, well, why don't you? And I said, because nobody's doing it. And he goes, and so why don't you? And I said, okay, I think that's a smart thing to do. So I came home and told my husband who thought I was crazier than a loon. Um, and they said, nope, I'm really gonna do this. I'm gonna be the only one who hangs up my litigation pumps and never talks about litigation again and only talks about mediation. I'd like to take a minute and if you can put in the chat, you know, your answers. How many of you own a pet who are on here? I mean, just say yes or something. I'm sure most of you do, or you can raise your hand. I can't see your pictures, but I'm sure most of you own pets. Um, and then if you could tell me if uh, you consider your pet a family member or personal property. Uh, I have a slide on here that tells you what the answer to that is, but I'd like to know what all of you think. Um, the third question I'd like to ask, just to get a feel for the audience, have you ever been involved in a litigation um, or disagreement over a pet? Um, and finally, uh, what did your litigation involve? Did it involve divorce or a neighbor conflict or a veterinarian malpractice conflict or some other service provider or the dreaded dog park issues? Um, if any of you have had those, pop them in the chat and um, I will look at them. Oh, great. There's 11, 12. Perfect. Um, it it really is important. Um, I did when I had my Rottweiler. Um, you're the human. Yes, they're the human, aren't they? Well, we could really... Um, be more like them if we could. Yes, professionally, wildlife rescue. Thanks, Jill. It really is important to be able to bring these people together to have a conversation. And yet mediation is the last thing that people think of when they want to talk about the benefits or the care of a pet. Um, here we go. If you've had, oops, sorry. If you've had a case involving a conflict over an animal, um, well, we're going to skip that because I want to get through this so I can answer any questions. So these are my motivating forces. I have I have raised Irish setters. Well, I'm 
65. Um, so I've had one since I was 13 and I started raising them when I was 25. So I've had them a long, long time. Um, that's my horse art. That's my cat Jane. And, um, we have a little outlier there in English Cocker Spaniel. Now it's, um, it's an outlier, but that's what's part of my life. And that's what drew me here. And I used to do cases between breeders and owners and clubs and things because they always fight with each other. Um, Roger, you raised your hand. Do you, do you want to ask a question? No worries. Um, so Sorry, I, I raised it earlier in answer to, do I have a pet? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So these are my motivating forces. Uh, and this is what I do. So I began in Pioneered and Trailblaze, this DR practice that focused on conflicts. Can you believe it in 2010? We're in 2024. I can't believe it was 14 years ago. Um, what I didn't realize in 2010 is that nobody wanted mediation in animal law and welfare. They wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, uh, most of the animal law groups that I belong to looked at me askance, like, what are you and who are you and why are you here? And a few of the really smart, intelligent people, uh, I think they're some of the smartest people in the world, and none of them practice really animal law full time. They do it as an aside. Uh, more do now. They said, well, we appreciate what you do, Deborah, uh, but we want to set precedent. And your taking a case out of the legal system doesn't help us set precedent. And I said, well, then you're not thinking about the animal. You're thinking about winning. I said, and, and I'm going to think about the animal from start to finish. So um, let's look at where conflicts over animals begin. So many of you probably have had a divorce with a pet. I don't know if you've had questions with emotional support animals and service animals. That's huge now. Relationship breakups, they're not covered by the new legislation, yet they have been applied to the new legislation. Really interesting. Contracts, nobody ever as a lawyer look at a contract before they sign it. They only have a lawyer try to enforce it once it's broken. This is a mantra with people with dogs um, or horses. I, I have a whole equine group that I, I, I just thought it was dog people, uh, but it's really everyone who has an animal who signs a contract never reads it. Even the people, lawyers who uh, adopt, own shop, never read the contract to know that they can never place this dog and that they can come in and take the dog if they feel the dog isn't being cared for with no questions asked. And they go, I can't believe they, I, they wrote this in the contract. They said, did you read it? And they go, no, I was doing a corporal work of mercy. And I said, yeah, let's have a conversation. I'll tell you that the case that pushed me over the edge was when a rescue would not listen to um, a client I had who was trying to do the right thing for a pet, keep it until the puppies were born. She had adopted it. It was pregnant. She had five weeks left until it would have its puppy. So she said, I'll keep it and give it back to you. And the rescue said no. And litigation ensued. It was awful. And she got to keep the dog. She got to keep the puppies. And the rescue lost everything. And that's, I think, what pushed me over the edge in 2010 to decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. Because the only ones who are being harmed are the people who aren't being listened to. And I'm going to help them be listened to. And there's got to be a way. And that's when I started my journey. Veterinary disagreements are huge. I work so closely with veterinary dis veterinarians because they are not taught in school how to talk to clients. I don't know if any of you have had really bad discussions with veterinarians. I'm working on it. I'm also working on helping clients have better skills in being less reactive and defensive to the veterinarians because then they can also um, find resolution to different disagreements. Co-op condo, any of you who live in a pet um, environment in a co-op and a condo, terrible dog bites. I think that um, mediation is is the best first step. I might be disagreed with, but that's my thought. Uh, trust and estates. No one ever talks about the pets, um, both in trust and estates and if something happens to you. Nobody talks about it. Nobody makes a plan. Um, animal welfare, animal rights, uh, dog parks, dog sports, incredible wildlife protection, and international law. In the animal law and welfare circles, litigation is the preferred mode because they want to set precedent. Asking curious questions and finding the best outcome for all has not been a priority for them. And even though I've been here now 14 years and there's been two or three conferences where they actually spoke about sitting down with a group and having a conversation, of course, they didn't invite me to speak, but I put in applications all the time to speak. It's okay. I'm not in academia. 
Um, so there's that. Uh, but it really is important for me that I'm having them think about it. I don't need to be the person. I just need them to think about it. Um, animal laws mantra, in in my humble opinion, is they need to be right for the animals. Um, my mantra is I want to get it right for the animals. So it's really important. So in conflicts over animals, there are so many emotions that are triggered. Any of you who have pets know that when you're talking about an animal, you need to feel heard. Most animal owners and affected people don't. They're fearful that somebody's going to come and take their pet away or something's going to happen and their pet is going to be held responsible. They are absolutely terrible listeners um, and they need to be the pet's champion. It can't talk. I need to be its champion. I'm like, you can be its champion, but you don't have to go into litigation. Um, on the other side, they don't actively listen. Uh, they're they're afraid of the consequences. They don't want to know what the consequences are. They believe they do. They haven't really explored it, but they're afraid of them. Um, they would prefer to keep the status quo and uh, they need to win and they need to be right. Um, so in animal law disputes, the law still states that animals are property. As we found out at the beginning here, most of you don't feel like your dog is a chair uh, or your cat is a car not something that's going to happen. Um, yet to the animals, their family members. In fact, the Pew Research uh, found that 51% of respondents say their four-legged four friends are just as important as a child or a partner. My husband has just gotten that English cocker and I would venture to say, he repeats it all the time. He says to me, um, well, I do love this dog. I, I still love you more, but I really love this dog. And I understand because she is um, a cuddle bug and she is wonderful. So these animals are really creating um, such grounding for us and, and good um, emotional, uh, filling emotional needs of ours. So that's why they're so important. Um, why does mediation work in most conflicts over animals is because we assist people to actively listen. That's our job. That's what we do. We let them tell their side of the story and be heard. As we know in mediation, almost always the sides never hear the other side. Even if I'm telling you my story, I'm not listening to you because I'm busy thinking about how I'm going to respond to you. So I'm really not listening to your story. We're in mediation. We help them take that breath and really listen. Um, we appreciate and maybe understand the other side's point of view after we're given the opportunity to listen. Um, and that's where we can then keep the pet's best interest top of mind. Um, pets are not property in mediation. And if it doesn't work out, you know, the biggest thing I always say is if it doesn't work out, you can still go to court. And I'm not a I'm not a fan of arbitration in these matters because it's somebody else making a decision for you about the pet or somebody else deciding what's who doesn't really have skin in the game, so to speak, making the decision. So I'm really a um a proponent of using mediation because that's where the people get that assistance from us as mediators to take a step back, take a breath, and really focus on whether or not our beliefs are true and what we can do to maybe take baby steps to the next best step. Um, and of course it's confidential, which I love. Um, so remember, do not presume that you know what's best for them. So as mediators, this is something I always say, I know you all know this, you know, we don't know and we can't give them our opinion of what we can do. I'm sure some of you have had people say, um, well, you know, I, uh, I, I want you to tell me what to do. And we always say, no, that's never gonna happen. We have to make sure that we find the best way forward that's good for you. Um, help them find the words to diffuse the anger. Most of my practice now, because mediation is still a little foreign, um, still a little, suspicious. Uh, people think that if you call in a mediator, you've already had a conversation with them, which they haven't, but people don't believe that, and that you've told them their side of the story, and so you're going to be on their side, um, and that's not true, as we know. However, that's how people with animals, they're so fearful when they have a discussion about animals. Um, I love this book, um, STFU. Some of you might have read it um, from Daniel Lyons. I 
try to subscribe to it. Uh, and I always keep a roll of very colorful duct tape, um, either next to my computer if I'm on a Zoom or on the table. Uh, and I don't explain it if it's a Zoom because nobody can see it, although sometimes I suggest that we all use it uh, so that we don't interrupt each other. And that I remember, I usually put it that I remember not to think I know what's best for you, uh, but to let you get there yourself because that's what's going to be lasting. Um, oops, what's happening here? Here we go. Oh, next. Oh, it's not moving. I wonder what's happening. Um, hmm. Well, Ah, uh, there we go. Um, let's look at the new laws. So some of you might be divorce attorneys and some of you might live in these states. And there's a new law out there that judges are required uh, when they render their decision to consider the best interest and well-being of the animals in divorce. Hmm. Best interest or well-being. And it was in Travis v. Murray, um, a, a different standard, but they had um, tossed that away. I'll talk about that later. So the state legislat uh, legislatures are creating these new requirements for judges, which I'm sure if any of you are judges here, you're so thrilled. Um, yet they didn't create a uniform method of evaluating the process. Oh, we're so surprised, right? Here, this is a new law. We don't know how you're going to apply it, you know, case by case. Uh, how are we going to help judges evaluate these cases you know, and not take into account their experience, their perspective, their bias, their perception. I mean, it depends on if the judge is a pet friendly person, isn't a pet friendly person. Maybe it doesn't mean that at all. Maybe they're totally um, objective and they're wonderful. That would be great. Um, however, they're making a decision for someone based on one day's testimony. Um, and that's why I believe mediation is such a better use of finding out what the next best step is for any of your animals. Um, the pros of the new le legislation is that, you know, they're no longer simply property. They've been elevated, these animals, which of course, if I go into long dissertation, would be very scary for veterinarians at this point because they're moving. Veterinarians have always based all of their work on that, you know, pets are property. Uh, a good friend of mine, um, Oh, Bernard Rowland, who was the father of veterinary medical ethics, uh, wrote an article that said, are you a doctor or are you a mechanic? And veterinarians want to be doctors when they're practicing medicine. If something goes wrong, they want to be mechanics because they only harmed property. And none of you would say that would be you know, true. It's not property, but it but it is property under the law. Uh, I, I said to Natalie when I um, got on this morning, I said, there's a new... Um, decision that just came down January 23rd of this year that wants to um, allow to recover for emotional distress damages. Believe me, this is happening. And if, you know, it, it may be a bias on my part and I raise my hand, I think that being able to resolve these things in mediation where we recognize that animals are not property and that they mean something in mediation would be so much more beneficial than litigation. There's a place for litigation. I'm not against litigation. However, I think that for the animal's well-being, mediation is the quicker, um, the more, um, um, I guess, uh, respect responsive to all the issues. Uh, that's just the way I feel. Um, Pets are recognized as failure. Evidence is taken on the party's relationship. This includes where the animals thrive. So this pesky um, precedent, Raymond V. Lockman, uh, has driven me nuts over the past um, many years uh, because although the pros of uh, the new legislation is that there is more court oversight, does the court want that oversight? And Raymond V. Lockman set this standard of where the dog feels love, has been loved, has thrived, which is created um, decision-making now with these new seven legislative um, requirements that leave the dog usually where it is. Um, the cons of the legislation, as I said, it usually leaves the dogs where they reside. In one case, the party stole the dog in Acosta v. Shaw and had it for a year and a half before it came to trial. And the judge said, well, it's, you know, it's living with for a year and a half. We're not going to disturb it. Was that fair? 
I don't know. I, I think in mediation, we could have had a different outcome. Um, judges make decisions based on a day of presentation, um, the ownership documents, the veterinary records, the payment for food, the you know walking, the doggy daycare, whatever it is, are no longer dispositive. If you've done all of that, still no longer dispositive because it's if it's living for a year and a half with the other party, that party might get it. Um, there was an LC and CC that was found that was decided in New York, and the deposition actually said he took care of the dogs. The dogs loved him. The dogs missed him when he left, but they were two Rottweilers, so he couldn't find suitable housing to move into. So he left the dogs where they were, and they were awarded to his wife, who never really took care of them. Did she love them? Yes. Did she take care of them? Were they as bonded to her as they were to the husband? No. And I guess I'll get to it, I'm sure. Um, the thing that bothers me the most is then you never get to see the dogs again. Because once you and I get divorced, we're never going to see each other again. And to me, that leaves a lot to be desired. Um, court decisions made under this new directive are subjective. They apply for only full custody, not shared custody. You know, unfortunately, your pet doesn't hate your ex. You wish they would. And if something happened to you, these decisions don't give you the ability. I said this um, to Judge Matt Cooper when I did a program with him uh, for FDMC uh, back in, I think, January of 22. I said, Your Honor, but what happens if the possessory owner can't keep the dog? He goes, well, then they pick up the phone and call the other person. I said, but we've already established that we're never speaking to that person again. So how do we do that? That's not written in the order. And you seem to think that would be the right thing to do, but they're not required to do that. So it's just, to me, not the best of all worlds. There's no first right of refusal. There's no communication for financial assistance. And there's no return upon death of the possessory owner, which I think the animal would appreciate. Um, some more cons. You could probably tell that I'm not a fan of this legislation, even though everybody came up to me when it passed and said, aren't you glad the judges get to make this decision and, and pets are more than property? And I go, yes and no. Um, so judges make these decisions. Oh, this is, it's not turning again. Okay. Um, usually words of word. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'm getting stuck here. Ah, there we go. So in Mitchell v. Schneider, the court applied the best interest for all concerned in the in the um, breakup, and that was not a divorce. And remember, most of the legislation is under the domestic relations laws of the states, but it's now being applied to relationship breakups as well. Um, it discusses the following intangible factors that need to be considered. This is important in determining which pet you know, which party will promote the well-being of the pet? Who is the who is in the best position and able to meet the dog's daily physical and emotional needs? This sounds all great, right? And healthy, active lifestyle and time constraints, you know, feeding, watering, bathing, taking the dog to the veterinarian, access to pet stores, engage in outdoor recreational activities. Well, great. That was both of them that they shared, but now it has to be one person. And what happens if something happens to them? Never considered. Um, this is the limited case law so far. They never have visitation or right of first refusal. And the courts really have been completely unwilling um, to have shared custody under this new legislation. And I can understand that because they don't want to monitor uh, shared custody. Um, the court in Lacanti v. Um, Kamegi Lee suggested an informal ownership agreement for the pets and divorce parties should have an informal agreement because legislation has not provided guidelines. I like this um, for courts to use as a catch all to address specific facts of each case. Really important. You need to be able to do this together. Um, judges faced with these issues, uh, party participate in the decision making, find animal behaviorists. This is really important, and this is what I why I think judges sending this to mediation might be the best thing in the world, because you know it gets the parties to participate. And I know that a lot of attorneys, and we love them very much, because some of us are attorneys. Um, still, we haven't been disbarred. However, we've chosen the Kool Aid of um, alternative dispute resolution of some form. It really creates that ability for the parties to participate. And if we can get their lawyers to allow them to participate, that's been one of my, my strongest issues in mediation is that if they come with lawyers, often some of the lawyers are not mediation friendly. I know none of us have ever bumped into an attorney who isn't mediation friendly, but I've had a few and it makes it really difficult. Um, I also really highly recommend finding an animal behaviorist or an animal expert to evaluate where the pet's 
seem to thrive the best and not automatically decide that the pet remains in where they are. Um, make arrangements also to assure that they um, maintain their standard of care physically and financially and return the pet to the ex-pet owner if the possessory pet owner can no longer care for it. Um, mediation of all types of pet conflicts allows for the discussion of uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable present and future challenges. I have clients who never see each other again. Thank God for Google calendars, right? And thank God for taxis that pick them up. Thank God for dog walkers. Thank God for doggy daycares uh, because you can leave it there and then you can drop it off. And I really never have to see my ex again. However, the pet gets to see it. Some animal behaviorists would say this is too traumatic for the animal. Um, after 40 years uh, having dogs, I have found that in most cases, the animals enjoy going to and from. I had uh, a divorce where the woman was a triathlete and uh, the husband uh, was not. And so the dog would love sitting and watching football and eating Cheetos with his dad um, and would love swimming and biking and running with his mom. And these were things he loved doing. He didn't love doing one or the other. He liked the break. I mean, all of us like a break. We like, you know, Cheetos on the couch. Um, they fully participate in the solution um, and you get everyone to take a minute and we know this to appreciate and take accountability and responsibility for where the pet would best thrive. Um, it's more fully addressed and mediators foster intentional discussions about a beloved pet. And that usually doesn't happen in court. We talk about the intangibles, what I paid for, why the pet is, you know, I took it to training. Mediation allows for those really deep discussions that focus on what is really in the best interest of the pet and not the anger of the breakup. Um, I have a podcast and on that podcast, I had Doug Mintz and we talked about this uh, and he said, you know, you discover you, you're considering the best interests or the well-being of a pet. Why would you give the decision making power of the future care of your beloved pet to a person just because they wear a black robe? It, it makes it me crazy and it usually um, makes everyone crazy to think about that. Um, I have uh, this process that I use with a lot of my clients that I wanted to share with you. Uh, some of you might remember when we were young, stop, drop, and roll. Uh, you're on fire, your clothes catch on fire, you stop, drop, and roll. Well, in conflicts over animals, I have given this to veterinarians and to clients who you know deal with people with animals, and I just remind them to stop talking and listen drop the need to be right, and let what people say roll off your back. Often people are so emotional that they don't have the ability to think before they speak. We know about reactive and defensive conversations. Um, so if you give them the opportunity to say what they say, don't rise to the bait, don't be reactive and defensive to them, you can often have a better conversation. Um, during the pandemic, um, so many people had disagreements over pets and um, I, I would sit there and just go, just listen and, and take beat. Um, and when I gave programs to veterinarians, they would often say to me, but don't I have to answer my client right away when they're mad? And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> um, take a minute because you're emotional, they're emotional. Appreciate and acknowledge doesn't mean you agree. And then have a conversation the next day that gives both of you the opportunity to get out of your amygdala, which is where you go when an animal's um, involved, get back into your prefrontal cortex and maybe be able to think about better outcomes for everyone in this particular conflict. And that works across the board. I've been working with a number of um, international groups who are trying to um, help save animals in sanctuaries, um, help support uh, safaris that then support neighboring neighborhoods, um, have those discussions so that the concerns of the surrounding um, cities uh, with all the animals in the sanctuaries, what can we do? Uh, we just had a program um, on the pangolin 
who looks like an armadillo, um, but is really having an issue um, with poaching. And we're working on discussing it with the local people in the area to understand the value of that pangolin to the life of their family, because it's worth almost a year's worth of salary on a job, um, and then leaving it in the wild. These kind of conversations, um, you know, stop drop the need to be right and let it roll off your back helps you create that atmosphere in which to have this conversation. I love this quote for all of us. And this is probably what I have been doing since 2010. I've been doing the best I can until I know better. Um, and I'm on the job training every day. And then when I know better, I do better. And I think that's what all of us want to do and where animals are concerned really being able to set precedent, set legislation, you know, write legislation, have laws put in place is really, really important. However, who's going to enforce them? How are they going to be enforced? Um, you know, a, a lot of people say all the time, you know, well, nobody's enforcing these laws. And if I, I said to Natalie at the beginning, what I'm what I'm trying to do is have a conversation that shifts a paradigm one step at a time so that even in, you know, animal abuse, we all know that the common circle is animal abuse to child abuse to domestic violence to elder abuse. If we can have a conversation at the beginning, do some restorative justice at the beginning instead of just a fine and move on we will likely be able to um, shift that trajectory of someone who abuses animals, get them the help they need at the beginning so then it doesn't go into something more. Um, you know, working in the world of animals has been very, um, uh, this is my contact information, um, has been very rewarding for me. Uh, I'm going to stop the share now. I would love to hear what um, everyone thinks because I know we're um, over a little early, but I I wanted I didn't want to talk all the time. I'd love to hear your thoughts and what your experiences have been because when I'm on this um, group, I always think that the interaction between the members is so important. And if I can help anybody who's having a problem, um, just let me know. Yes, Anne. Um, Deborah, I'm absolutely fascinated and thank you so much. In this short period of time, you've given me an education I didn't have before. I'm well aware that the growth of pets in the population has become so very important, whether we have a pet or not, it has to be acknowledged. I was wondering if you know, is there anything being done at the law school level in teaching this very important area of the law? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Anne, because I am sending out, um, I've been asked by two or three law schools to create a program so that they can um, bring mediation into animal law. Uh, it hasn't yet been done. Uh, when I wrote, oh, I guess about five years ago, the ADR uh, coordinator at Lewis and Clark, one of the biggest animal law law schools in the country, uh, if they wanted to work with me to bring ADR into animal law, um, I heard crickets. Uh, so I'm like, okay, that's what I said. I'm not in academia. And they just had a whole restorative justice program uh, at the University of Vermont. And I put in four programs of which none were picked up. And I get it. It was all academia. It was all people who'd been in academia talking about animal law and animal law. And as I said, they were a little slow to come along. I'm more this practical person who says, let's sit down and have a conversation. Let's listen to the other side. So in answer to your question, no, it hasn't necessarily um, been, uh, it hasn't infiltrated animal law um, uh, dispute resolution. Negotiation has, they really do negotiation, but dispute resolution in the way that mediators practice it um, hasn't been as prolific as I would like. Uh, I'm creating that this year. That's my mission for 24 is to create three or four programs. I've been asked for the University of Tennessee. My colleagues at the University of Vermont said supply something. My good friend Robin Weinstein at Cardozo said, you know, give me something and we'll put it in. So it's up to me to move this um, forward. And, and I will. And anyone who wants to help, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I'm only a one man band, you know. 
Just amazing. That's fantastic. That would be great to have uh, Deborah at the uh, law school uh, level. And, um, you know, I, I must admit, when I got the phone call from my friend saying that her son and um, his girlfriend had gotten into this dispute over the dog, um, I was relatively incredulous. And they have spent so much money. They went to court and have spent so much money now. It's heartbreaking, really. They shouldn't have had to have done that. They would have been much better off going to a mediator. So it's a great service you do. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it really is important. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, Deborah, if you could put that last slide with your contact info back up. It went oh, real sure. fast. Sure, absolutely. Um, because it, it, you know, to me, it's, um, okay, share screen. Come on. All right, there we go. Um, it to me, it is it's so important for us as dispute resolvers. And if you're in litigation, listen, I was in litigation um, for twenty years before I drank the Kool Aid. Okay, so I get it, and that's why I always have to have the duct tape uh, because I slip back. I I I'm not a cured uh, litigation alcoholic, but uh, I try. It just seems to me that even if it doesn't work, as we all know who do dispute resolution, if it doesn't work, at least the parties feel heard and the, um, the you know, travels through court might be less um, adversarial. I mean, that's what we can only hope for, right? That we at least get people to hear each other and maybe at the end of the day, do something um, a little bit uh, better. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, I can't see anyone. I'm going to stop the share. If everyone's got it, I can stop the share so I can see everyone. Well, um, now we all know the. Well, now we all know the mediator to refer someone to if they really if they have this kind of a pet dispute. So thank you for that. And there are a few of us. I mean, there's uh, one in Canada as well. Uh, my husband gets very angry when I help mediators do this and I go, I can't do it myself and I've got to really shift the paradigm. So if you're having a problem and you need help, don't hesitate to call me. I'm, you know, I, I'm not um, an authority. I just sort of created this, you know, gig because everyone who's fighting over an animal usually simply needs somebody uh, to calm them down, to take a minute, um, to, to breathe. And then they can have a conversation. I had a video up. I still do on YouTube on how to talk to your neighbor with a barking dog. And it seems so ludicrous to me because it's so silly, but I said, you know, number one, don't talk to them when you're mad. Okay. We all know that. Uh, number two, take them for coffee. Um, even though you don't want to take them for coffee. And then when you start the conversation, start it with what are we going to do to figure this out? I mean, now all of us here know this is such a simple concept. Um, however, it really is something that most people, when they're talking about animals, if you knock on the door of your neighbor with the barking dog, they're not going to open the door because they're afraid of you. They're afraid of what you're going to do. They're afraid of what you're going to say, especially if you've been screaming from the backyard, right? I mean, I'm not going to open the door. And then that escalates and then terrible things happen. So. So Deborah, this is a fascinating presentation. Thank you for it. And one of the things that fascinates me the most is this is an incredible case study on how to pick a niche and be the pioneer and specialize in it and really own this territory as a, uh, from a marketing perspective. So can we talk a little more about how the decision has interacted with your marketing strategy and how your marketing strategy and, and subject matter specialization work together? Well, it's a learning curve for all of you. So if you have a passion, clearly I do, um, to do one thing and do it well, uh, you need to then see who is your end user. Um, attorneys aren't necessarily my best end users. I would like to think they are, but they think they'll call me, pick my brain and then do it themselves. And usually it blows up and then I have to fix it, but it's okay. I appreciate that they call me. Um, but then I realized, well, I, I speak to um, breeders and owners at their national clubs because that's 
that's easy for me because I am a national club board of directors. So I have some gravitas. I've had um, uh, some big winning dogs. Uh, so people know me, so they would call me. Then I said, well, who else might need me? Well, veterinarians need me, although they're defense attorneys don't necessarily want them to ever talk to anyone and they'll mediate, but they'll mediate after the pet owner sues, which of course all of us know is not necessarily the sweet spot of mediation. The sweet spot of mediation is when the veterinarian and the client are in the office together. And if I can get the veterinarian to learn stop, drop and roll, if I can get the client to learn stop, drop and roll. I just was at a conference in Chicago for the American Veterinary Medical Association's leadership group. And they actually wrote up a great program. It was myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Danny McVetty, who mentors vets. Um, and we talked about how to have the skill to take a breath, how to listen. I, you know, imparted my stop, drop and roll, uh, because if they, I say, put it up in your office, nobody will know what it is, but it'll be a cue to you that this is what you're going to do if somebody's driving you nuts. Um, so I, I worked the whole veterinary industry and I have to say, uh, 14 years, I'm just about getting asked to speak because one talks about me and it's word of mouth, you know, she's not so bad. Uh, you know, we lawyers are insular. Well, veterinarians make us look like friendly people. Um, they really are insular. And of course, because I keep talking about the fact that pets are going to be more than property and you really need to get on this bandwagon of resolving conflicts before they go to court and set precedent, I really am an outlier um, because their um, PLIT, their personal injury liability trust uh, under AVMA keeps telling me, Deborah, we do mediate. We do. We just think there's nothing to mediate until a client sues. And I know that's a typical personal injury thought because you have to have some discovery and some information. In the pet world, you can nip a conflict in the bud with a client if you give the veterinarian the skills. So that's what I've been working on. I've been working on making sure I put programs together um, for corporations that have veterinary um, groups underneath them and for smaller veterinarians who just want their practice to work better and the culture to be better, to teach them how to speak to each other in a way. And it's simply mediation light. You know, we just sit there and talk about what it is or how you respond. Um, but to build this, my marketing was that I did um, YouTube videos on these little small vignettes um, that people are looking for, uh, how to talk to your neighbor with a barking dog, how to divorce, how to talk to your veterinarian, how to talk to your groomer, you know, your kennel person, um, and then how to talk to your angry client as a kennel owner, as a groomer, <laughs> as a veterinarian, you know, little things to draw them in, to have them say, oh, there is a better way than having to call and litigate. Um, litigation is expensive. Litigation is, you know, the well-being in veterinary medicine is terrible, terrible. They have the highest um, number of suicides of a profession. It used to be dentistry. It's now veterinary medicine. And veterinarians are leaving the practice of veterinary medicine since COVID because of the treatment by clients. So when I speak to them, I say, I'm telling you how to speak to clients and I want to let you in on a secret. I talk to clients on how to speak to you. I said, so if you meet someone who starts using my techniques, you'll go, you were trained by Deborah Hamilton. Yeah. So that you are speaking to me in a way that's really nice, you know, that at least is thoughtful and, you know, they're, they're listening, they're actively listening. It's very important. So my marketing did that. I wrote articles for different groups. So I write for Today's Vet. I wrote for Canine Chronicle. Um, I wrote for the ABA. I wrote for the New York State Bar Association, the New York City Bar Association. Um, I've been on um, the podcast for New York City Bar um, Miranda rules. I love him. David Miranda. He's wonderful. Uh, with my friend, Scott Maloof, we talked about um, the issues with um, Johnny Depp and his girlfriend, because it had to do with animals as well, which is why I was dragged in, which I loved. Uh, so you just have to collaborate with your colleagues. I just went to the New York State Bar Association annual meeting. And of course, we haven't been in person in a while. I walked in, everybody goes, ah, the dog mediator. Okay, a little bit more than that, but I'll take it. <laughs> So, Deborah, do you find yourself being hired by veterinarians, kennel owners, et cetera, in contrast to being hired by lawyers who represent those people and companies? 
Um, I'd say it's 25, um, 75. So 75% is the people come to me to help them resolve the conflict before it gets to lawyers because nobody mm -hmm. wants to work with a lawyer. I love you all very much. Nobody wants to work with a lawyer. Uh, and 25% are my colleagues who call me and say, I can't do anything. Can you help? And now actually in North Carolina, um, I'm being um, sought out because I have several colleagues here from the equine um, subcommittee of the ABA, big horse country here, uh, to mediate conflicts. So they've sort of put me out, my name out there. So I've been being called by the attorneys and the attorneys talk to me and they see that I'm pretty neutral. I'm pretty well versed in what's going to happen. And um, I, I can probably facilitate a better outcome than going to trial. So how does it work if if there's a claim for money damages, uh, usually insurance gets involved. I'm sure the veterinarians have malpractice policies, as do the kennel owners have general liability policies, things of that nature. And insurance generally comes in when there is a claim. Right. A claim is a term of art. And in many places, that means a lawsuit, not just a, you know, not just somebody complaining about something informally. So how does it work for people to get you involved without lawyers, but if there's no quote unquote claim within the meaning of the insurance policy, how does the insurance money, where, where does the money come from to settle these? This is the greatest question because this is my nemesis, um, Jeff. So as I said, there's that sweet spot between when the veterinarian and client have a disagreement and when the client is required to go to the insurance company or the veterinarian is required to call the insurance company. So first of all, I'll let you in a little secret. Veterinarians never read their malpractice um, coverage ever. So they never know when they have to call. I mean, we're all surprised by that, right? But anyway, they never read it. So I've had I've, I'll, I'll tell you an actual case I had. So I had a woman who had a dog who ate something and the vet went in, took the collar out, left a little piece of the collar in, the dog went septic. It was a big magilla. They had to go in again. It was terrible. Um, and so she wanted to sue him and she called me and I called him and I said, listen, she'd like, she want to mediate first. Um, and he said, oh, I want to mediate too, because I really want to talk to the veterinarians who did the second surgery and what I did and what they found and what I could learn from it. He was great. It was wonderful. And as we were setting up the mediation, I had to say to him, now, Dr. Smith, you have to call your malpractice insurance company and say, I am engaging in a conversation having to do with something that I did and I need your permission because it's in mediation, it's confidential. You know, if litigation comes, nothing that's said there can be used against you, which of course attorneys will argue, yes, it will, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, and, and so I said to him, you have to let them know. So he said, oh, all right, I'll let them know, but I'm fully in, I wanna do this, I wanna learn, you know, I, I wanna pay her back out of my own pocket, blah, blah, blah. P.S. The insurance company says, well, we will not um, defend you if you lose and we won't defend your license if she reports you to the Veterinary Licensing Bureau. So you make the choice. So then the pet owner gets pissed off because she has to hire an attorney. The attorney who's representing her doesn't want to mediate because there's no money in it for them if they mediate a resolution. And so they create this this spinning vortex out of control. Um, and then of course she wants the value of the dog's breeding rights and the this and that, and you know, hundreds of things when she probably would have been happy um, with just recovering all the fees that she spent to save the dog's life. So that's mm -hmm. what happens. And you're right. And I know this, and this is my nemesis because if I can get the parties to resolve it, I just had a, um, a case where a woman's dog, uh, they've spayed her and they nicked her liver and uh, she almost died. She was nine years old, the dog. And the woman was not a nice woman. She was persnickety and really said things in a way that would make your skin crawl. And so she called me and I talked her off a number of ledges and we worked together, not in mediation because she, there was no way she was gonna get anything if she went to mediation and the insurance company got involved. Um, 
at that point. So we wrote a letter to the veterinarian and said, listen, this is what happened. We'd like to know how you might be able to help us. And the veterinarian sent it to their insurance company and said, you know, this woman gave us a very um, reasonable request and we want to make her whole. And the insurance company said, okay, let us look. And um, this client of mine said, oh, they're never going to give me any money. I said, let's just put good energy out to the universe. Um, and I helped her have a better conversation than she probably would have had. And she recovered $29,000 from the insurance company. And then they said, well, you have to get the rest of it from the veterinarian. And she goes, oh, they'll never pay me, you know, blah, blah. I said, well, let's just write them and say, you know, thank you very much for being so supportive of helping us get this money from the insurance company. And what can we do to, you know, make it up? And the veterinarian gave her the rest of the money. But to your point, the insurance companies um, are not in the business of paying uh, veterinary bills, they will find anything to hang their hat on. And in this particular case, I was really worried if the insurance company reviewed the paperwork because the surgeon who went in and saved the dog's life said this injury was likely due to a too deep cut on the initial surgery. The, the veterinarians who followed up with this dog who weren't in her belly all backpedaled. Well, maybe it was, but maybe it wasn't. It's not dispositive. Well, you know, maybe something else occurred. And I sat there and I said, I'd love to choke these. And I say that with all love and affection, these follow-up vets, because they weren't in her belly, right? They don't know. And so they were creating this, this hook for the insurance company to hang its hat on not to recover the money. So Deborah, let me ask you about the question of mediation ethics and values. We talk about neutrality. And in that circumstance, how did you view your role? Were you acting as an advocate for the pet owner or were you acting as a neutral mediator? I was acting as a neutral. Um, I wasn't mediating because there was no mediation at that point. I wasn't talking to the insurance companies. Often I will take the time to help people word things in a less adversarial, less defensive way uh -huh. and have them send the letter under their own name. So I, I call that conflict coaching, you know, being able to help them get the, what they need with a little assistance from someone who's going to talk them off the ledge of telling Jeff exactly what they think of Jeff. Well, that's helpful, but you're not going to get any money from Jeff if you tell him what you think, but let's think about having a moment. My mediation abilities are thwarted by the fact that we would never have gotten there had I stepped in as a mediator and said, let's talk about this because the insurance company would then have said, and they have said, because I had a case where I stepped in, talked to the insurance company um, as a mediator, wanted to mediate between a veterinarian who had given someone's cat away because they microchipped it and it belonged to somebody else, which is in violation of the VCPR because you're not supposed to scan a cat unless the person who brings it in, who you have the, v the veterinary client patient um, relationship with, that's what a VCPR is. Uh, you're not supposed to do that unless the person who brought the cat in tells you to scan it. Well, she scanned it. Um, and she called the person on the scan and the person on the scan said, well, I have two more cats now. I really don't want this cat. And she sort of bullied the person into coming to take the cat. She took the cat. And then my client went, wait a minute, where's my cat? Um, and the bottom line was that the insurance company said to me, um, and this is why I shifted my methods a little, uh, well, she has to sue us and then we'll consider it. If she doesn't sue us, we're not considering it. We think our veterinarian did the right thing. Wow. Well, and on that note, uh, we are at the top of the hour. So uh, we can well see why your services and services like yours are so needed. Good luck with the uh, law school curriculum. And um, thank you so much for being part of We'll Work for Food. We'd really, again, like to remind everyone if you are so inclined, if you're able um, to make a donation to the um, the two charities that uh, Deborah mentioned to one of Animal them. Animal Alliance or the Cat Protection Council of Westchester. I'd greatly appreciate it. Sounds great. Or to any food bank of your choice. That's right. Absolutely. And then let us know if you'll let us know the amount of the donation, we would be thrilled to add it to our running total. So with that, we are concluded. Thanks again. We'll see you next week, everyone. Same time, same place.
Thank you, Deborah. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.